Mac 364 on final approach, not acknowledged for the transmission. Four and three quarter miles from runway, approaching glide path. Will should be down. On course, heading 050. Begin descent. On glide path, on course. An Air Force four engine jet attempts an emergency ground control precision radar approach landing. Minus two engines out over the Pacific and complicated when bad weather closed in some 1,300 miles from the coast and home base. The burden falls on the aircraft commander, the co-pilot, the navigator, and the ground controller. Yet it sounds rather routine. On course, holding slightly above glide path, on glide path, two miles from touchdown, on course, on glide path, on course. Slightly below glide path. The ability of each individual to meet the demands of the situation represents far more than just his own efforts. It is a dramatic example of training systematically planned, conducted, and evaluated in terms of performance requirements as reflected in meaningful criterion objectives. This film Another in the instructional technology series explains what criterion objectives are and why they are the key to successful performance. After viewing this film, you will be able to, one, explain how criterion objectives are derived. Two, identify the three essential characteristics of a criterion objective. Three, list three major benefits of criterion objectives and four, personally use and encourage others to learn about and use Criterion Objectives. I'm Captain Bruce Krauss. Like many other aircraft commanders in the 141, we find ourselves in very tight situations once in a while. For an example, just a few weeks ago, we had to go into an airstrip of which the last 1,500 to 2,000 feet of runway were damaged. It's a real challenge putting this airplane in at an airstrip of 4,500 feet. I don't know too much about those criterion objectives, but I do know I'm fully qualified to handle this airplane. And I guess that's saying something. Fully qualified, able to perform the mission. Ready to go fly? That's what objectives are all about. Here's a multi-engine jet. How do you prepare someone to fly it, navigate it, load it, land it, repair it, tow it, inventory it, control it, fuel it, secure it, improve it, budget for it, or any of the thousand and one different things that go into getting it airborne and on its way to mission accomplishment. Having been appointed an Air Force cadet in the United States Air Force. Having been appointed an Air Force cadet in the United States Air Force. And how do you graduate second lieutenants with the knowledge and character essential to leadership and a career in the United States Air Force? That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. Graduation day, no matter where it occurs throughout the Air Force, is a happy one, but it's also an expensive one. It's estimated we spend several billion dollars a year on training and education. And we've been turning out guys who can fly, navigate, and perform in technical specialties for years. But the real question is, can we do it better and more efficiently? By now, you've heard about ISD, Instructional System Development, the five-step model where we first analyze the system, then define the education or training requirement, develop objectives and tests, plan, develop, and validate the instruction, then conduct and evaluate the instruction. In step one, we define our goal through a comprehensive task analysis using occupational surveys, interviews, and work inventories. When you begin course development by finding out what a worker actually does, instruction can be designed to precisely meet the demands of the job. In step two, 
Instructional standards are developed to specify the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and the level of proficiency needed for realistic performance. This step pinpoints the items requiring formal instruction and identifies the major resources which should be used. Step three is the subject of this film, the development of objectives that are job relevant. For the aircraft commander and co-pilot seen in the first part of the film, it goes back in part to an objective achieved in the flight simulator. For the navigator, his in-flight mission replanning required And for the GCA controller, all the objectives have three things in common. First, they each specify the behavior or performance activity by which the student displays the skill and knowledge required for the job. Second, they each indicate the condition or circumstances under which the student must perform. And third, they specify a standard or criterion, which is the minimally acceptable level of student performance. Performance conditions, standards, P, C, S. What are the three characteristics of a meaningful objective? Performance, conditions, standards. The performance or behavior is described in concrete action verbs, stating what the student does to display his newly acquired skill, knowledge, or attitude. You don't say, the pilot will know how to handle an in-flight emergency. You state that he must maintain flight upon the loss of two engines. You don't say, the navigator will understand how to replan a mission in flight, but you prescribe that he performs in-flight replanning. And you don't say, the student will learn how to control a precision approach. You specify, the student will control a precision approach. The conditions under which the student must perform are usually expressed in terms of provisions and restrictions, what the student is given and what he is denied. And these should, as nearly as possible, relate directly to real life. Setting the standard expected of the student completes the objective. Often expressed in accuracy or speed, the standard specifies the satisfactory level of student performance. Now, here's an objective from the personnel officer course. What portion specifies the performance activity?
what conditions are imposed? And what standard is required? You can now see how a meaningful objective is constructed and how the performance activity, the conditions, and the standards combine to make the instructional intent crystal clear. When objectives have been based on a thorough analysis of what is required for real-world performance, the instructional designer is well on his way to the next step in building an instructional system, planning, developing and validating the instruction, then conducting and evaluating the instruction. You've got to know what you're trying to do before you figure out how you're going to do it. A thorough task analysis and careful definition of instructional requirements, combined with well-written objectives, provide a sound basis for the selection and development of learning activities, media, and the actual instruction. There's no wasted time or effort on the part of the students or instructional staff. The staff works together to zero in on clearly defined goals. The student is continually aware of what's expected of him. There's reduced frustration and an improved morale and attitude. And when he graduates, he'll meet the needs of the requester, the need which originally instigated the requirement for the instruction. Now, all this sounds perfectly plausible and proper, so what's the problem? Well, for one thing, objectives aren't as easy to write as we've made it appear. We've given you the basics, but writing a good objective can be a real challenge. As you move from simple skills to knowledge to attitudes, our methods for evaluation are not as precise, but we are making progress. Take this one, for example. How are you going to improve it? As you work with criterion objectives, one thing you'll discover is that objectives can be rated on a scale from very fuzzy to very clear. Just because your desired learning outcomes don't at first seem to lend themselves to clearly defined behavioral terms doesn't mean you don't need objectives. Although the more clearly defined objectives can be more effectively applied to instruction, it's not necessarily bad to work with less than perfectly defined objectives. By continuously re-examining objectives, you'll be able to clarify them. You'll find they can be improved and achieved, and you'll have more time to deal with other unclear objectives. This objective we've used as an example is now much more useful for an instructor who wants to evaluate his students' pride in their work. But it can still be improved. How do you define voluntarily? What is minimal assistance? How will you know if a student complains? Further refinement will produce an objective that specifically states what the student is expected to learn. After all, the purpose of education or training is to bring about a change in the learner. Learning is change. And objectives are the way you express this change. So, Although at times this change may seem difficult to express, if you expect to teach a skill, impart knowledge, or affect attitudes, you've got to find a way to verbalize this change. And if you don't have good objectives, or if they aren't based on real-world requirements, you're kidding yourself and doing the Air Force a disservice. You'll waste time, manpower, and money by overtraining, undertraining, misdirected training, or possibly in no training at all. And you'll also endanger Air Force mission accomplishment. Writing well-defined criterion objectives is a challenge and takes time, but it is cost-effective. And there's no way you're going to train or educate people effectively without them. It's that simple.